The other day I found myself in London, outside Selfridges actually, on Oxford Street, watching shoppers and they were pushing each other and shoving, looking for bargains. And looking at these chronic spenders, it would be easy to think that all was well with the world economy, but it is not. While they worship at the altar of retail, London's frenetic shoppers miss what's coming right down the tracks at them. First, a rapid slowdown in China, second, a fading recovery in the United States, and third, the continuing crisis in Europe. Let's look at China first. Chinese Central Bank has slashed interest rates twice in a month. Are the Politburo panicking? Yes, they are. The Chinese investment boom is faltering, but politically, economic growth and the Communist Party are now umbilically linked. Since it dropped all its Maoist carry-on, the only legitimacy the party has is growth. Prosperity, not equality for all, is the latest slogan. Recession is simply not an option. If they don't deliver economic growth, they are toast. In terms of political slogans, what's the Chinese for? It's the economy, stupid. But just cutting interest rates alone won't help the Chinese because the problem there is too much capacity. So building yet more will only make the problem worse. Chinese manufacturing just saw its eighth successive monthly decline. The markets are pricing all this in, gold continues to sell off, and oil is close to $80 a barrel for the first time in eight months. At the same time, the US employment recovery, essential for Obama's re-election prospects, is fading away. The US only created 80,000 jobs last month, and even if the Fed's cut, what can cuts in nominal interest rates do when real rates are already negative? The recent numbers out of the US are awful. Average earnings down 0.2%, retail sales down 0.2%, industrial production down 0.1%, housing starts down 4.8%, consumer confidence down 5.5%, and car sales down 4.5%. The much hyped recovery is evaporating. Let's go to Europe. After the euphoria of the EU summit, Spanish yields are now again above 7%. The phony war is over. The real one is now beginning. After the summer, it's clearly Germany against the rest. Either Germany pays for everyone, or the euro falls apart. Without looting German savings, there's absolutely no chance that Spain or Italy can finance themselves in the months ahead. Growth is close to zero, while yields are moving towards seven. Next year, Italy must refinance existing debts to the tune of 29% of GDP. Now, Merkel originally said no debt sharing as long as she lives, but she blinked. Why did she? The rest of Europe still assumes that Germany will remain, in the words of its brilliant Chancellor Willy Brandt, an economic giant but a political pygmy. But what if this is wrong? Think about everything from the German point of view. Even if the Germans paid for everything right now, prompting the biggest bull market in Spanish and Italian bonds, and a massive bear market in German bonds, it still wouldn't solve the core of the competitiveness problem. Spain and Italy can't compete with Germany, full stop. The promise of the Euro was that we would all become more German, but this hasn't happened. In fact, the Italians have become more Italian, the Spaniards more Spanish, the Greeks more Greek, and the Irish more Irish. We wanted a German lifestyle without German productivity, and what we didn't earn, we borrowed. By backstopping Italian debts now with German money, the Italian isn't incentivized to borrow less, he's incentivized now to borrow more. The reaction in Germany to the summit has been uniformly negative because people realize that they will now have to foot the entire European bill. So politically, things may change. For Chancellor Merkel, putting Germany first might make her isolated in Europe, but would be very popular at home. And given that she is a politician who wants to get re-elected next year, which way do you think she will jump? This means that the European debt deal 
might unravel. There is still, therefore, a very high likelihood of a financial battleground in Europe which will follow the 1944 pattern as markets attack various sovereigns. This will begin with a significant battle in Italy, followed by a massive attack on France, much like in 1943 when Germany was initially attacked through Italy, but the big invasion, D-Day, came through France in 1944. France is the weak link. It pretends to be a slightly shabby version of Germany, but the French banking system is very fragile and the country runs a large current account deficit. And while it may throw shapes politically, France is economically weak. The 1944 pattern will go something like this. Spain and Italy could well be locked out of the market in due course. Germany's vulnerability will then be in her western borders. As French yields rise, Germany must make a choice. Does she risk everything for France? The average German allergic to foreign debt would probably say Nein danke. But the politicians and strategists deep inside the German establishment wedded to the central pillars of EU integration will probably say we. Oui. The discussion will then move to a compromise within Germany. German politicians will realise that they can only sell the deal to save France by abandoning Italy and Spain. As this year rumbles on, the German High Command will want to avoid a war on two or possibly three fronts. Globally, China is rapidly turning down as their bubble bursts. The American economy might even tip into negative territory and the Germans will realise that they can't rely on external support. So they will have to act fast. Remember, the Germans aren't saving France or Spain or Italy. They want to protect themselves from having their savings plundered by foreigners. For the rest of us, the choice is now between a German rock and a global hard place. And yet all the while, the shoppers of London carry on spending, oblivious to the impending storm.